All right, if it gets close to 1 o'clock, uh, someone give me like a five minutes or something. I, I do get paid to teach, so I like to talk. And talking is what I do best. So, uh, you know, we could get, you know, really into this, right? Especially if anybody wants to ask questions. But please feel free to ask questions, uh, you know, while I'm talking, absolutely. Um, or, you know, answer, I'll answer your questions at the end. Or I'm happy to uh, stay afterwards um, as if you don't have a class and answer questions personally, right? So again, my, my name's Dr. Dana Perderman. I have uh, graduate degrees in anthropology, geology, archaeology. I um, have more graduate degrees than any same person should actually have. However, I absolutely love it here. Um, I teach all the geology classes and all of the anthropology classes here on campus and online. So if you get a chance, please uh, sign up. Right. Today I wanted to talk about uh, a cult, what's called cultural appropriation and I wanted to just give uh, an opportunity here to talk about what it is and what it isn't, um, how to think about it, uh, some of the things that have happened recently uh, in the media, uh, why it's a big deal, uh, and what you can do about it. Yeah. So what is cultural appropriation? So from an anthropological scholarly perspective, right? Well, this is a field of study that is studied in anthropology quite a lot. Um, it's a fairly new field uh, within the last 20 years or so. And uh, it's looking at uh, systems of oppression, systems of colonialism, uh, decolonialism, which is now also a, a subcategory of anthropology that's studied. And uh, it's just looking at the idea that um, cultural elements can be uh, misappropriated by the dominant culture. And when cultural elements can be appropriated or used by the dominant culture without any uh, explanation or without any ask, uh, with no um, understanding of the culture that they come from, right? So when you have that kind of uh, unequal power struggle within a culture, uh, then you, you have a situation in which uh, oppression can continue and it still continues uh, to this very day. Right? So uh, one of the big parts about a cultural appropriation, and I'll talk about what, a cult, what is called cultural appreciation, right? How can you appreciate a culture that's, that doesn't end up being stigmatizing or hurtful uh, to the culture that you're supposedly appreciating. But the big part is re really down here, right? That the money, when, when the minority culture has been or continues to be stigmatized or oppressed uh, because of that element that you think you appreciate so much, that's where the problem lies, right? So in many situations, in many uh, instances historically in this country, right, we can go back all the way back to the Egyptians, right? Cultural appropriation has happened anytime one culture takes over another uh, area, right? But if we want to just stick to the United States, okay, uh, we can have a problem um, when the dominant culture can be seen as edgy or exotic, and we'll talk about the exotic here in a second, or uh, when the, uh, the dominant culture can just be seen as it's a different aesthetic, uh, it's something cool, right? But the minority culture in which that element comes from is then stigmatized for using their own cultural identity, right? And I'll give you some examples, okay? So here's a really great example that was in the news back in 2014. I don't know if you caught it, uh, but uh, uh, Christina Fallon is, uh, was the first daughter of Oklahoma. Um, she was the governor's daughter, and she did a photo shoot um, with several different headdresses. This is, this is the one that made the news. Uh, the, the headdress actually comes from eBay. Um, it's just some person that made her a headdress. She didn't have it specially made. I mean, it's literally just a, a, a made piece, right? Uh, she was heavily criticized for these photos, right? And she uh, made a statement that kind of made it worse in which she said 
she had great respect for the uh, Indians of no Oklahoma and that she was appreciating their culture. So there's a couple of problems with that, right? So one, uh, she's not listening to the people in which the minority culture in which the headdress comes from, right? So when someone says to you, you know, that's offensive, you might just stop you know, right, and think a little bit about what they're saying, okay? So when an entire culture comes to you and says that's offensive, okay, maybe you should really stop and think, right? Uh, she didn't want to do that. She got very defensive, right? Two, uh, the other problem with this is the history of the uh, war chief headdress, right? So this headdress is actually, has actually been banned uh, historically for, from use by Native Americans, right? It was seen at, in, in the 19th century, it was seen as uh, if you wore it, you were declaring war on the United States. It was considered treasonous to wear this headdress by a Native American, right? You could go to jail as a Native American. You could be shot by the U.S. Army in some instances, especially here in Wyoming, right? So here's, that's the problem, right? Do you, you see, you see the, the unequalness of power is that, right? Uh, a, a white girl, right, uh, has no, um, there's, there's no punishment for her wearing this headdress, right? But for Native Americans, up until the 70s and early 80s, this was illegal in many states for Native Americans to wear this. Right? And so there are people still today, right, or that are alive, who remember being banned from wearing their traditional gear, right? From wearing their traditional clothes, from wearing their traditional jewelry, right? So this is one of the big instances where eventually she sort of issued a kind of half apology that she sort of got it, but did she really? Kind of hard to tell, right? So why, it's a, why, why is this a problem, right? So I just talked about right, uh, historical violence of colonialism, right, where people were actually um, killed, uh, put in jail, right, uh, we have a history in this country with Native Americans, especially where Native Americans were taken, Native American children were taken from Native American families and placed with white families as adoptive children and to be raised in the white culture, right. So there's lots of still historical harm that has been uh, perpetrated against minority cultures uh, in the United States. Right? Another couple of reasons, right, is religious, right? So uh, the, the headdress, right, it's not just of Indian tribes, for example, for the, the chief. It's also a symbolic uh, religious uh, type of, uh, of, of headdress, right? So it'd be a bit like uh, me as a Catholic wearing a yarmulke, right? A Jewish uh, head covering, right? Because it looks cool, right? Well, right, it actually has extreme significance in Judaism, right? It, it literally, when you wear the yarmulke, it actually means that you are remembering that God is above you, right? That has an extreme religious significance for a minority group of people uh, all over the world, but also in this country, right? So what you're saying is, it's okay for me to wear it uh, as a uh, privileged person in our society because it looks cool, it looks neat. I, I just thought I'd try it out, right? Some intellectual property rights, right? So when you, you some of those things, these uh, have actually been debated at the UN is uh, we have uh, concepts of cultural property rights. Uh, when uh, indigenous cultures that have been taken over, uh, the area has been taken over by a dominant culture, right? Wars happen, it happens, it's happened since uh, humans have been human, right? But when you have this situation in which you have unequal access to power, right? 
then you have issues of intellectual property rights that belong to the entire culture. And so uh, you've heard recently um, where like Abercrombie and Fitch, uh, Gap, um, a couple of other big name um, retailers have gotten into some hot water for uh, using Native American um, symbolisms, right? Um, inspired, they'll say sometimes inspired by uh, Native American art or sometimes they'll literally just rip off an entire tribe, right? And they're making money on it. Right? And that's really a lot of times where the problem lies, right? is that they're literally making money off someone else's artwork and they didn't ask. Right? And so this happens very often with, uh, you've seen uh, Native American symbolism of like the whale and, and totems and the eagle and uh, those types of, of stylized animals. Right? Those are very specific art of the tribes along the west coast of the United States. Right? That art didn't just come from somewhere. You can't just sit down and draw that. Right? That's very specific, symbolic, religious art. It has a religious significance to those people. And when you say, oh, I saw it, it's cool, I'm going to redraw it you know, based on uh, what they wrote, and then I'm going to go make money off of it. Right? That's, that's problematic. That's cultural appropriation. Right? So what isn't cultural appropriation? Right? So this gets tricky, right? Because uh, sometimes it, it has a lot to do with intent, right? It has a lot to do with your motive. Was your motive to make money? Okay, you, then did you talk to any Native Americans, right? Then that's probably cultural appropriation, right? And you probably know that, but you know you don't care until someone uh, calls you out on it on Twitter, and then you you as a company make this big apology, and you know you got caught. Right? So you knew it was cultural appropriation, but sometimes it's tricky. Like, is someone just uh, you know, wearing um, uh, a dress that maybe looks uh, Chinese? Right? Um, it, you know, the, there was one recently where she went to the prom and uh, her dress was uh, Asian cut. Right? And, and a lot of people called her out for cultural appropriation. And she's like, I bought it at Walmart. Right? Um, so is that cultural appropriation or is that just uh, someone made us uh, a dress that looks like uh, has a, a, an Asian flair to it or a flavor? Right? Uh, some of the other uh, types of cultural, uh, uh, cultural assimilation, right? is then when minority cultures can actually have a chance to um, uh, do things that are traditions of the majority culture, right? And that's really seen as, I think, actually, I have that as a different slide on the next slide. I kind of got ahead of myself there. But um, eating foods from different cultures, I've been asked that many times. Is that cultural appropriation if I um, have... Um, uh, Mexican night at my house and eat tacos. Is that cultural appropriation? No, right? Okay, right? No, no person from Mexico actually thinks tacos are Mexican. Okay, that was a joke. Come on, laugh, right? Cora, you're required to laugh at my jokes. Yes, yes, right? So wearing fashion inspired by a different culture especially, right? We can do this and we can do it well when we actually bring in uh, indigenous artists, for example, right? And that's some of the good types of cultural appreciation that are happening recently in the fashion world, right? Is when we're actually uh, uh, going to a tribe and saying, hey, we want to partner with you to make um, you know, Native American themed skirts uh, for a national audience, right? And the Native American tribe is like, hey, that's a really great idea. We have a couple of artists in our tribe who would be interested in doing that. And they're then making money, they're making a profit, right, from that intellectual property, right? So someone actually went and asked them, right? Going to a wedding, I've had this uh, asked of me specifically. Um, gentleman married um, a, a girl from Guam, 
and uh, her family wanted him to come in traditional attire to the wedding, and he was actually super nervous. Um, even though he, the, her family was actually saying, no, we want you to dress in a traditional male uh, garb, right? Uh, he was like, I'm not sure that that's appropriate because I'm just, you know, he's this white Irish guy with red, flaming red hair, right? And he's like, I don't, I don't want to be offensive to anybody. And I said, that's not offensive when the family is asking you to do so, right? Uh, you know, can other people be offended? Can individuals uh, that live on Guam be offended? Sure, right? happens all the time, right? Individuals can take offense, right? That no one person speaks for the entire island. No one person speaks for an entire tribe, right? But uh, when you have situations, you really do have to look at the context of the situation, who's asking and what's your intent, right? Is your intent to uh, say, I am accepting my bride's uh, culture as uh, part of this new family, right? That's really what, very much so, what um, the, the, her family was trying to make sure that everybody understood, that she wasn't just marrying a white boy, right? That she was marrying someone that was respectful of their culture uh, and who was going to respect their daughter in the future, right? So you, you got to think about, kind of think it all the way through and make sure that you're asking the right questions for cultural appreciation. I put up a picture of a clodda ring. Right? Uh, the clodda ring is a traditional uh, Celtic uh, symbol uh, before uh, gold for the most part, before diamonds. Um, clodda rings are traditionally made in silver and uh, it's actually a, a very Roman symbol. It goes all the way back to Roman times with clasped hands. Right? Uh, clasped hands, uh, that symbol actually signified getting married, love, uh, those types of, of, of emotions and uh, were traditionally used uh, all through Europe as a way of signifying um, betrothal. Right? So you actually you wore it, uh, uh, the crown towards the heart. Uh, if you were betrothed, you wore the heart towards your heart if you were actually off the market and taken, right? So is the Clodda ring, right? They can, they're sold at Claire's, right? Uh, or the, is that cultural appropriation, right? No, by any anthropological stretch of the imagination because the Irish who brought over the Clodda ring uh, in the early 19th century uh, to the United States Right? are not an oppressed people. Right? They have always been able to wear the clotta ring. They've never had um, it stigmatized. Right? They've never been forced to leave their job because they were wearing such a ring. Right? You can think of lots of instances where people have been sent home from work because they were wearing different types of jewelry, right? traditional jewelry. Right? Clotta ring isn't one of those. Right? So the, think about the issues of oppression, think about the issues of, of stigma, of punishment, and motive. Right? And that tells me that the clotta ring is not cultural appropriation, even if you're not Irish, you had no idea how to pronounce clotta ring, and you certainly don't know how to spell it. Right? Right. So all this comes back to what is cultural appropriation actually doing? What, what are we doing when we culturally appropriate items? And uh, uh, Kirsten Johnson uh, is an anthropologist. Uh, she wrote a really great article. And uh, maybe you can take a look at it if you wish to. And she uh, talks a lot more about cultural appropriation than I have time for. Uh, but she talks about the exotic. Right? As, as a noun. What is the exotic and what are we doing? We are objectifying uh, cultures, we're objectifying cultural elements, we're fetishizing them almost in a way. Right? Uh, we are stripping them of their cultural context and we are simply saying, I'm going to do this because it's cool, 
right? Because it's different than my culture, right? It's edgy, it's new, right? And all of those things are, are things that we appreciate in our culture. We appreciate new ideas, we appreciate new symbols and new imagery, right? But the problem is, is when we appreciate the imagery, but we don't appreciate the culture, right? When we appreciate the imagery, but we don't appreciate the culture. Okay. The imitator who does not experience that oppression okay, is able to play, right, like, uh, like a little child, is able to play right, an exotic other without experiencing any of the daily discrimination that that culture faces, that a member of that culture faces on a day-to-day -day basis. Right? There's the problem, right? You get a chance to make believe, right? To s turn on a suit, right? And then you get to take it off, right? And you don't have to deal with being with that in that culture. You don't have to deal with being a member of a stigmatized uh, society or a stigmatized cultural group. Okay? You get to just put it in a closet and wait until next Halloween. So sometimes it's fun to dress up, but remember what you're dressing up as right, can be problematic because what you're saying is it's fun to stereotype, it's fun to be someone else for a minute, but I wouldn't want to be them forever. Right? If you can't say, I would love to be them forever, it's probably cultural appropriation. Don't wear that. Okay, that was another joke, everybody. Come on. So here's a really great example of the flip side, right? So cultural assimilation, right? And so I get a lot of comments or questions about, well, you know, if, if cultural appropriation by the uh, dominant culture from the minority culture is bad, isn't it bad the other way around? Like, isn't, shouldn't the minority culture do their minority culture thing, right? And leave the dominant culture our white people stuff, right? For lack of a better term. Um, identify as a white person, right? I'll say that, okay? Um, no, it's not the same thing at all, right? Because when you have a dominant culture and you have minority cultures coming in, right? It, it's called the melting pot. I think you probably all have heard that term, right? In social studies, like in eighth grade, right? It's this idea that when you, as the minority culture, are coming into the dominant culture in order to survive, in this new dominant culture, cultural assimilation happens. So you actually take on traditions of the dominant culture, right? So you take on the garb, right? These are all uh, Cherokee, Choctaw, uh, and there's some Muscogee here. Um, these are uh, Native Americans who are taking on European dress in order to survive, in order to prosper in this new dominant culture, right? When you have systems that say, uh, in many cultures around the world, every time a dominant culture comes in and takes over a minority culture or a minority culture comes to a dominant culture, of course, uh, the dominant culture says, you know, win in Rome, right? When in Rome, do as the Romans do, right? So that saying's been with us for a couple thousand years now. There's something to it, right? The dominant culture is dominant. They're the ones that hold the reins of power. So the minority culture coming in, right, in order to move up the social ladder, they have to take on traditions of the dominant culture. That's a survival mechanism, not cultural appropriation. So there's a couple of major uh, examples of cultural appropriation, and I think you're all probably familiar with some of the co controversies around mascots, around sports mascots. Right? So what do we usually name sports mascots after? Uh, not usually animals. Right, and that's because of some of the more uh, social progress that we've made on cultural appropriation, right? That we've started in, uh, in uh, uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul, the hockey team is called the Jazz, 
<laughs> what mascot is that? Yeah, I don't even know. I think they've got like a sort of amorphous animal thing that jumps around at their jazz games. But, right, the jets, right, stuff like that. But uh, we also, for the most part, name our sports teams after animals, after powerful animals, the bears, the eagles, right? But we also have a tendency to name sports teams uh, after Native Americans. And uh, one of the biggest examples of this is the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Right? Uh, they retired the chief um, in 2007, right? and uh, it's still a controversy today um, on whether or not um, they will even use, uh, they have a stylized um, chief in a headdress uh, that they use on hats and such. And uh, they still use that today, and they're still having conversations about it. And um, it's, it, it's the history of the chief is super problematic, right? So the history of the chief, right? He starts in uh, 1926, right? Uh, he's called Chief Illiniwek, right? Uh, that's the full name of the Illini tribe in which Illinois gets its name from. There are no Illini anymore. They were all completely destroyed, right? They were all murdered, right? So there are no cultural people that can say, that can speak up for themselves and go, hey, right? Here, this dance that he does, okay? I, I've been to, I used to live in Champaign, and I've been to uh, sports where uh, Chief Aliniwick uh, does the um, fancy, it's called a fancy dance, is what he does, right? He doesn't wear shoes, right, when he's doing this dance. Um, Everything, his headdress is actually um, a Sioux tradition. It's not Illini at all, right? Um, it was uh, actually designed and um, the dance was actually designed by Boy Scouts in, uh, in the 1920s. Um, so all of the symbolism, right? None of this, no Native American has ever portrayed the mascot. Right? This has only ever been white males, uh, uh, white male students uh, to portray the mascot. Right? So when Native Americans are saying, look, you know, there's a couple of things that we might not agree on, but we all agree that this guy's offensive. Right? It's not a controversy anymore. He's offensive. Okay? You see what I'm saying? Right. Um, right. In 1926, there were still, all right, uh, um, agents of this government actually actively pursuing powwows across the country and jailing Native Americans for participating in their own Native dances. Right. That was still illegal in many states to even dance. Right. Because again, uh, drums, drumming, uh, was seen as treason. It was seen as, as, as a war dance, right? War drumming, right? It was seen as uh, sedition against the United States of America. Right? So this, this white guy, right? He gets to do this fake Indian dance, right? At a sports event, right? But Native Americans, when they do this dance, they could be put in jail or even shot on sight. Right? Problematic, to say the least. Right? So other examples, I get a lot. I get uh, asked a lot about um, black hair, for example, uh, especially with women. Right? Um, Michelle Obama has talked about um, black hair uh, quite extensively. If you want to look up. Uh, black hair, Michelle Obama, if you Google that, um, she's, she's made several interviews about uh, how uh, African American women are stigmatized for their hair. Right? So, right, I have uh, very, uh, as they say, very Becky hair, right? It's long, it's blonde, it's straight, right? Uh, and that's seen in the dominant culture in the United States as the uh, going aesthetic, right? It's the ideal. Right? I don't happen to think it's very ideal myself, but right, 
Uh, it's the aesthetic, right? And for a long time, Native American women, uh, uh, African American women, um, have been stigmatized because their hair was curly, uh, is kinky, they, it, it goes up in an afro, right? It, this is how it grows naturally out of their head, right? And um, it's just I pulled a couple of these off, and um, uh, if, if you want, um, I can give you a copy of, of this PowerPoint where I've uh, um, given credit uh, to um, each of these women that have um, taken pictures. Um, Right, so this is cornrows. It is um, a very African hairstyle. Right, it's a way of working with black hair. It goes back to Africa several thousands of years. Right, this specific type of braiding. Right, so Bo Derek. Anybody recognize Bo Derek? Right, she's a '70s icon. She was considered the most beautiful woman in the world. Uh, and she was a, um, a model, uh, she did movies, right? And um, she has several famous pictures where uh, she's really the first white woman photographed in cornrows, right? And cornrows and in beads, specifically, right? So she basically, she went on safari to Africa, saw this, came home, and had her hair braided that way, and did all of these photo shoots, and made sick amounts of money. Right? And no one said anything, right? Because back in the 70s, uh, African Americans did not have a voice that said, hey, could you maybe think about what you're doing? Uh, we are actually being stigmatized for wearing cornrows to work, right? So number of people have actually been fired for wearing braids, right? Because it's considered unprofessional when uh, African American women do it, right? This is literally how this grows out of her head. All she's done is really put it up in a ponytail, right? She should be able to go to work, right, with her hair manicured, but as it come, grows naturally out of her head. And up until recently, right, there have been uh, dress codes at colleges, uh, dress codes at work, right, dress codes uh, at, in the U.S. Senate. Right? about black hair, right? that it was in unprofessional. Right? It's unprofessional because black women are wearing it. It's not unprofessional because it looks unprofessional. It looks unprofessional because it doesn't look white. Right? Keep that in the back of your head. When something doesn't look professional to you, are you really talking about something that's keeping them from being successful at their job or are you just saying it doesn't look very white, right? Twerking, great example, right? Miley Cyrus is the first uh, uh, white girl to really twerk on the stage. And a lot of people were like, well, no, she twerked great. Like, she actually did the dance the way it should be done, right? Okay, that's true. But she gave no credit uh, to the African dance, right, to this tradition of twerking. Right? And that when you see regularly on the internet, uh, when black women are, doing, are twerking, right? they are uh, degraded, right? they are stigmatized for it. Black women's bodies have been stigmatized throughout uh, this country's history. Right? Uh, black women have been said right, that they have uh, large butts, right? and yet... Uh, that large butt is what's fetish, fetishized as opposed to respecting the woman who has uh, the ability to twerk, right? It's not the easiest stance on the planet. Not everybody can do this, right? So instead of respecting the skill and the artistry of this traditional dance, we've, fe we've really fetishized it in terms of uh, shaking your booty, right? Iggy Azalea, right? Very problematic, very controversial figure, right? Uh, she grew up listening to rap music. Uh, she loves rap music. She's very appreciative of rap music. And then she went and made her own rap music. And that might not necessarily be a bad thing if she was talking about her own lived experience, 
right? That's what rap music is all about, right? If you look at the history of rap music, right, what they're talking about is some of the issues, especially uh, African American men, are talking about some of the issues that they have in the inner city and how they can't, you know, find work and how the, it's so violent and they can't get to school, right? These lived experiences. Well, so if you listen to a lot of Iggy Azalea's earlier songs, they literally sound like she's a black man from Compton, right? She literally just took their experience and started singing it, right? So she basically ripped off their lives and their, their oppression, right? And has made a sick amount of money doing it. Right? So then the, we can talk about music as cultural appropriation. Okay. Okay. This is a, um, it's called This Is Not Okay. Um, it's a um, program uh, that STARS uh, started uh, several years ago, and they put out uh, new posters uh, on occasion. Um, these were just a couple of them, um, in which these are actual pictures uh, that people took um, thinking they were funny, right? Him with his blue solo cup, um, thinking that he's right, um, a, a terrorist uh, with a bomb strapped to him, right? And he's not just a terrorist, right? He's specifically saying he's a Muslim terrorist, right? So this is a young Muslim boy, right, who's saying, you know, like what you've done is uh, hugely hurtful and can continue to harm because when you mix those two, when you mix violence with a faith and say that faith can only be violent, right, you can actually cause harm. Mm -hmm. Young Asian girl, right? Oh, when this is again another picture that uh, some white chick took of herself dressed up as a geisha girl or a comfort woman, right? So these were actually uh, during uh, World War I, World War II, uh, these were actually women that were kidnapped from Korea. Uh, they were taken um, to Japan, they were taken to China, and they were turned into prostitutes for the soldiers, okay? So when you dress like this specifically, Right? You are basically making fun of these women's struggles. Right? Unknowingly, right? maybe you didn't know, but that's cultural appropriation because you didn't have to know, did you? Right? You didn't have to know. Yeah. Right? So imagine for a minute if it happened to you. Right? So here's some images uh, that I pulled from the internet. Right? Uh, has anybody ever watched Dogma? Right? It's, it's a really funny movie. Right? And uh, they talk about Buddy Jesus. Right? All right? Uh, uh, you know, as a person of faith, you might find that a little offensive. Right? Uh, here's one. If you look up Bald Lincoln, right? They're all over the Internet. I do not why, know why people find this funny, but, right? Uh, right? Here's another one. Um, you know, my people are from uh, the Appalachians. And, you know, uh, yeah, that's a little offensive to me, you know. Uh, Caucasians, right? Uh, with the, the Cleveland Indians, if you're familiar with that mascot, right? So that's what they're rifting off of with a dollar sign sticking out of his head, right? Rednecks, right? Now, right? So we're belittling, we're poking fun of, we're just being just plain offensive uh, to white icons, right? And, and you don't get particularly worked up about these, right? Because you're the one, right, in a member group, right? As a white person, you belong to a group of people that hold the reins of power in this country, right? you don't find it offensive because right, there's something you can do about it. Right? You can really lash out. Right? You can be angry and it's not going to penalize you to do so. Right? Many, uh, especially Native American women, right? if they get angry right? or if they laugh too loud, 
they can end up getting arrested, right? There's all sorts of instances uh, that have happened recently where uh, black women on a train were forced to get off the train because they were laughing too loud. Right? They were just, lit it was like a wine train. They were literally just having a good time and were asked to leave the train. Right? So when you have these type of stereotypes, right, and you can laugh at them right, because those stereotypes are never going to harm you. Right? Personally, you as a member of the dominant culture right, are never going to be harmed by the fact that there's all these stereotypes. Right? They don't even happen that often. Right. So cultural appreciation, right? Some really great examples, right? I love Eminem. I'm I'm a I'm a white girl a, 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 over the age of forty. Of course I like Eminem, right? But he is a really great example of cultural appreciation of uh, rap music, right? And he's talked about this extensively. He's very aware of uh, his privilege as a member of the dominant culture in this society to be able to uh, rap and make a lot of money and uh, have white people buy his stuff, right? But the songs that he writes are about his own lived experience, right? He's from a very poor family, he's from the inner city, and he writes about that experience, and that's what makes his mu music authentic it's what makes, it makes his music interesting, but it's also what makes his willingness to use the rap genre right, as appreciation of rap music. Right? Yoga, right? We teach yoga classes here on campus. Right? Yoga is a really great example of where sometimes it can be cultural appreciation and sometimes it can't be cultural appreciation, sometimes it's cultural appropriation. Right? because uh, yoga actually comes from India and has a religious root to it. And if you're just using it as exercise, many Indians from India can find that offensive. Right. So questions to ask yourself, right? If you're doing cultural appropriation, if you're doing cultural appreciation, right? Um, you know, don't wear cultures. Stereotypes aren't cool, right? Uh, and listen, right? Listen to when someone of that oppressed group of people are talking and trying to tell you how they feel. Any questions? <laughs> all right, any questions? Well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate your time. <laughs>